Mike. Well, I wonder if you've got your Christmas tree up yet. You know, it's the 1st of December. Put your hand up if it's up. <clears throat> oh, good. Right. Did you know that you've got to have at least 500 lights per metre height? <laughs> now, my wife has got 800 lights per metre height. <laughs> I mean, when you're trying to watch the TV and these things are flashing in the side, it's pretty hard. Awesome. Shout out to you new parents, new babies this year. To this Christmas, you get to wrap their present. You get to open it. <laughs> they get to play with the, with the paper, and they're just very happy with that. Well, whatever your traditions are for the season, I hope you'll be with us over this series, Reasons for the Season. Can you remember the best Christmas present you got as a child? Just think back. Think about the feelings when you opened that present. What was that like, the emotions? A total surprise. But it was awesome. Well, for me, it was my first electric model railway. And hey, it just went round the circle, but it was awesome. It was so exciting. A gift is a special thing, especially when it's a surprise gift. Now, as we are, um, you know, adults mainly here today, Christmas morning isn't quite the same. You've probably already suggested what present you're going to get to somebody. But the real surprise gifts that are well-planned are very, very special. I've only done this a couple of times to my wife, I'm sorry to say. But when you plan a gift like that and you're building expectation into her mind, playing with her mind. She's trying to guess what it is, but you know that you've got something that is original, that is, she's going to love. It just makes so much of a difference to Christmas morning. And so my challenge to you is, for someone you love, that's special to you, is to start planning now. It's only the 1st of December, you've got time. Think about something special that you... That, that'll just be a total surprise for them for this Christmas. And it will make such a difference in the build-up to Christmas Day and Christmas morning. Historically, the birth of Jesus had some big, happy, surprise moments. Luke, who wrote the books of Luke and uh, Acts in the Bible, what we know as the Bible, he said that he had carefully investigated everything from the beginning, which included the announcement to the world of God's Son, the Messiah, King, anointed one, chosen, the Christ who would deliver. Shepherds in the fields outside Bethlehem, just minding their business, bored out of their tree, suddenly were startled by a spectacular announcement in the sky. Now, you've probably been to a couple of good you know, concerts or whatever, but this was way beyond that. It was, a, it was life-changing. A shock announcement. Today, in the town of David, that's Bethlehem, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. God was blessing the world by giving his son. The promised Messiah was here today. Now, the significance and excitement for them was, way back, they knew that a Messiah was promised to come. Abraham was given a promise by God that someone would come who would bless the world. And 42 generations had passed. And now he's here. They charged into town. I reckon they were a motley lot. They saw the baby Jesus and they, and they, and they spread the word. It made a lot of noise. And it was an exciting time. But they never forgot that moment 
with that spectacular array of angels. But the events of the world at that time overshadowed Jesus' birth. The Roman Empire was a chaotic but orderly place and the emperor decided that a census should be taken. Hence, Joseph and Mary ended up in Bethlehem. Everyone had to return to the town from which they originated to have their names recorded. Quietly, Jesus was born in a less than ideal situation. You know, for us, this season can be overwhelmed by the busyness, the work stuff, the work parties, the boss wants everything done by Christmas, family events, concerts, kids finishing school. It can all overwhelm and the essence of Christmas can be lost. Can I suggest to you that it's worthwhile carving out some time to look back through the records of the birth of Jesus and ask God to give you a fresh perspective, a wow moment. Use your imagination to think what it would be like to be there. Otherwise, you're just going to be stuck with Santa and the elves, some feel-good moments, and no lasting depth this season. Do you want the good news or the bad news? He wants the good news. Always a tricky question to answer. Might depend on your point of view. The wise men arrive in Jerusalem full of expectation and they're looking around expecting to find the king of the Jews. They're asking around, but surprise, surprise, no one seems to know where he was. And their question, their disturbing question, caused quite a stir. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star and it rose and we have come to worship him. Now, for King Herod, the thought that there would be another king, I mean, he was king, was very, very disturbing. A cruel dictator, not a fictional character, and you might not realize, but in the account of Jesus' birth in Matthew, over half the verses talk about this drama with King Herod. Self-obsessed, power hungry, not willing to share power with anybody else, wanting to be in control, in cahoots with the Romans. Nothing's really changed in their world, has it? <laughs> he called for the learned scholars to ask where Messiah would be born, and they told him Bethlehem. He sends the wise men on their way. Now, tr Herod knew the truth about the Messiah. He knew the promise. But for him, he was so far away from God that he was plotting the death of God's son. When we hear the title King Jesus, it can be a bit perturbing for people in our world. Christmas, Christmas challenges us with, who is Jesus? Is he the son of God? What authority does he have? If he's king, does, am I somehow accountable to him? What is his kingdom like? Of course, Herod completely missed the point of Jesus' coming and what Jesus' kingdom looked like. Talk about Jesus at the uh, work Christmas party. Wow, <laughs> that'll open up a few discussions. What is the truth <clears throat> about Jesus? I mean, truth is really important to us. When I go to the doctor, I want the doctor to tell me the truth. If you've got kids, you want your kids to tell you the truth. We really hate being told lies. What is in my food? I want the truth. Truth is absolute. If something is true, then it's true for everybody. Our belief about a truth might change, but the truth itself does not change. 
All truths exclude their opposite. So Jesus is God's son or he's not. Truth is really important to us, but sometimes only when it suits us. At other times in our lives, we can't handle the truth. And I invite you as a seeker of truth. And I think we all are deep down to read again the eyewitness accounts of the birth of Jesus. At life switch, we want to be a place where you can ask questions and not be shut down. To find and discuss and, and get the answers. If Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and I believe he is, then the implications for life are big. And so the wise men go on their way. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it arose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. <clears throat> when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. The power of a moment. The surprise to find Jesus in such humble surroundings. I'm sure there was tension in their minds as to how this would all work out. How would he become king? Such humility for him to be born into such a place. And yet his humble birth would foreshadow what his life would be. Humility. All through his life, Jesus would surprise people. A different kind of king. God was blessing the world with a different kind of king who came to establish a different kind of kingdom. Now Jesus went about humbly serving Powerful miracles. People interpreted him in different ways. Some appreciated the healings. Some loved the food. The religious leaders in that moment, on the whole, hated him. Even the 12 disciples anticipated that there would be a political kingdom that they would be a part of. And none would understand to after his resurrection what Jesus wanted them to really understand, that he had come to serve them. He said himself that the Son of Man, Jesus, me, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, predicting the death, his death and purpose. I wonder if you've seen those stickers around Maybe on a car somewhere, Jesus is the reason for the season. Well, I, if I felt really brave, would point on my car, I am, in bold, the reason for the season. Now, that would cause a stir in the supermarket car park. I can imagine some old lady coming up to me saying, who do you think you are? You're so arrogant. For people who don't subscribe to Jesus being the Son of God, of course, I am the reason for the season. It's all about the gifts, isn't it? The food, the parties, the holiday, good times. And yet in saying I am the reason for the season, I am stating a truth about Christmas. We are the reason for the season. And suddenly Christmas becomes very personal. If we dig deeper, if we are the reason for the season, then why? And Jesus said that he came to rescue us and to save us. From what? What could be so bad that the creator of the universe should step into time, into our world, and go through a whole lot of stuff, including dying on the cross? Sin. <laughs> that little word with a big meaning. The elephant in the room. Let's get the word out in the open a little bit more. The truth. We all do wrong things. We're all in this kind of mess together. And it's time to, I think, stop covering up the word. 
being like a psychologist and saying, well, you know, it's all relative. It's how you were brought up. Call it other names. Blame other people for your behaviour. But I, I don't really need to talk about sin too much today because we all know the guilt, the hurt, the damage in our lives, in families and in our world. And Jesus said that he had come to save us from sin's power and its ultimate consequences, which is separation from God. A broken relationship with God the creator that needs to be fixed in our lifetime. I love these words from uh, John 3, 16, where John records these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that's Christmas, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It's very humbling to say, oh, I am the reason for the season. And whether you've believed or you're trying to understand what Jesus is all about, the invitation is to come and see what Jesus has done, to be filled with wonder. I mean, love is another key word around Christmas. Can I see that I am deeply loved and highly valued by God? This is the message of the birth of Jesus. His coming to earth was not a fleeting kind of a visit without commitment. He was fully immersed in our world, our pain, our suffering, our mess, the consequences of our sin. He experienced it all. Well, Jesus is the king that blesses me by making a way for me to come into his kingdom. Jesus himself, his words were, unless you become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. <laughs> a child has no resources, no success, no achievements, no good deeds, no nothing to recommend or contribute to help them enter into Jesus' kingdom. And neither do we. Jesus' point was that we can bring nothing ourselves to contribute to us entering his kingdom. It's an uncomplicated humble prayer that I believe you Jesus that you are the son of God that you died on the cross for my sin I'm sorry for my sin please forgive me and give me your gift of eternal life we all come into the kingdom the same way equals he is also the king who lifts me up I love this verse again in John but to as many as received him, Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. Wow. Elevates us to sons and daughters in his kingdom. A new identity and relationship. He is the king who really cares for me. I don't know what your boss at work is like. Maybe they sit in an office somewhere in the cloud, <laughs> spitting out demanding emails the things they want you to achieve by the end of this year. A good boss is to be valued. I had a good boss, one or two over the years, but one in particular. She sat next to me in a desk. And man, was she good. She, she asked after me what was happening in my life, my family, really cared. And we had some tremendous side-splitting moments of laughter. In our, in our wider office. You'd do kind of anything for a boss like that. You'd follow them, do what they wanted. Now, it's a, that's a little bit cheesy, but King Jesus is committed to me. I will never leave you or forsake you. A different kind of king, the servant king who really cares. Not only that, he is the king who understands me. He feels my pain. He suffered unfairly. He empathizes with me in the deepest way because of what he experienced as he walked earth. He is the king who keeps blessing me, who invests into my life. 
as a joke, I thought about the gift that keeps giving and that I would buy this for my wife, the brand new shiny vacuum cleaner. (laughs) Don't you ever do that. (laughs) I only thought about it. However, if my wife, Hint Hint, gives me a brand new, for Christmas, Hitachi cordless impact driver drill, I'd be very happy. It's a gift that keeps giving. I would use it often. Every time I use it, I'd appreciate it. But the thrill even of the best gift, doesn't it? It fades over time. But Jesus' investment in our lives, day by day, year by year, is awesome. So what is the life in this new kingdom like? Is a kingdom defined by humility? I think nothing sums us up better than an incident in the life of Jesus on earth with his disciples. They were traveling the roads of Israel, and they were wearing fancy Nikes or something like that. They were wearing you know, Roman sandals or the early version of the Crocs. <laughs> the roads were dusty and dirty, and, you, and, and when you entered someone house, someone's house, you were expected to take off your shoes, and it was the job of the lowest servant to, to wash your feet. Gross. You know, between the toes, or probably a little bit of donkey dung. <laughs> and Jesus and his disciples were arriving at this house, and they had been, already the disciples had been arguing among themselves as to who would be the greatest in the kingdom as they walked along. And they're all sitting there in a row, sandals off, waiting for the servant to wash their feet. Horror. There was no one there to do the job. Imagine their horror as Jesus reaches down, picks up the bowl of water and the flannel and begins to wash their feet. I mean, if I'd been one of them, where would you look? (laughs) How embarrassing was this? Here's the king on his knees washing my feet. He turned king power completely on his head. He was humble but never weak. He was still king. He had lost no power. And he said, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now, I wasn't saying to go around washing each other's feet. But in In this moment of surprise, a moment of grace, he taught them a powerful truth. The key feature of his kingdom was humility. That's in the whole story of Christmas. We are called, if we're in his kingdom, to live with humility. And sometimes in his kingdom, you have to get down and get a little bit dirty to bless others. To go up in his kingdom, you've got to go down. To be humble. As Jesus said, I am among you as one who serves. No one likes to be part of a weak kingdom. You want to be on the winning team. This is the kingdom who grows, that grows in a completely different way. It grows as we serve and bless others with hum- humility. So, so pray. Look around for opportunities to serve others humbly. It is the kingdom in which we serve each other. Mutual serving builds a strong bond between each other, and I see that in Life Switch. Investing in each other's lives, it's a beautiful thing to see. Builds relationship, connection, Appreciation. Will I allow myself to be served when I'm in need? (laughs) That's another whole topic for us independent kind of guys who don't like to appear weak. Am I deliberately choosing to make myself available to serve others? And it is the kingdom that blesses the world. We are called to bless others because of the way in which we have been blessed, to pass on good things, to do deliberate acts of kindness. You are a blessing giver. 
you are investing God's blessings and life into this world. So in this chaotic season, maybe stand out from the crowd and listen well, encourage, do some random and deliberate acts of kindness. I wonder if you saw a key word as we went through this this morning. It's a game changer. Humility. Humility. It's what makes it all different. Jesus humbles himself to come down to earth. Entering into his kingdom is by humility. Living in the kingdom is defined by humility. Humility helps us serve well even when the going gets tough. The power to push through. Gratitude to God develops more humility. My kingdom or Jesus' kingdom? You can be part of something beautiful in this messed up world. Be blessed by God. Be surprised by God this Christmas. Surprise someone else with his blessings. The team's coming up to lead us in a carol, joy to the world. And as they come, I would just like to pray with you this morning. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. Help us to experience the full impact of you, God, with us this Christmas season. Forgive us when we take for granted the coming of your Son and we lose that internal heart wonder. Forgive us for not serving others well when we've been proud, angry, or we're just full of ourselves. We surrender to you to humbly serve with your generosity and in your power. Fill us with your joy. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.